Welcome to our presentation on teaching creativity in arts entrepreneurship. This is a study, a recent study by Stan Renard from Oklahoma University and myself, Monica Hersick at Indiana University. And we were collecting data together last year, spring of 2021, <clears throat> teaching parallel classes at <clears throat> the University of Texas in San Antonio and here at Indiana University. <clears throat> and our goal was to implement a series of creativity exercises in order to establish um, the level of creativity when the students started and later on and the level of increase that they experienced by engaging into in these uh, regular exercises. And the reason being uh, several, one of course, in order to be entrepreneurial, in order to come up with new projects, we need this growth mindset. And a growth mindset means we need to be willing to move forward, to uh, establish new directions, to believe that we can learn and grow, that traits are not set at a certain level, but they can always uh, be grown by practice, by engagement, versus a fixed mindset where we just believe that what we have is what we got. And if I'm just bad at drawing, I'm bad at drawing and there's nothing I can do. So in order to have this growth mindset, it's important to be willing to step forward and this uh, capacity of improvisation and, is, and, and creativity is a crucial factor for that. So what we did is we looked at the literature and the idea of teaching creativity is pretty recent. There is not very much actually because it's it's a difficult task. It's it's not as easy to measure as skills increases or knowledge increases. And it's only been pretty recent that psychology is even looking at creativity as a trait. And the way it's looked at m most importantly is this combination of divergent and convergent thinking, meaning for the highest level of creativity, there needs to be a process of divergent thinking, of just coming up with as many options as possible. And after coming up with as many options as possible to engage in convergent thinking, where we take these options and evaluate for usefulness, for sustainability, which then in turn makes these good ideas. And what, unfortunately, the way our schooling system is structured is that we consistently teach creativity out of our students. Naturally, children have a very high level of creativity, meaning they engage in this divergent thinking. They come up with the craziest ideas no matter what. And once you go through schooling, little by little, we, since we immediately have to engage in convergent thinking and decide if an idea is good or bad or right or wrong, these two um, ways of thinking collide and cancel each other out. So our goal is to find ways and initiatives to re-engage and get students to find, so to say, their natural abilities again and, and uh, develop them since in our current creative economy, this is an essential life skill to survive. So what we did is we took our two classrooms and we came up with a set of exercises that we both implemented in our classrooms throughout the sessions. And the way we structured the exercises, we used the model that I developed um, several years ago based on the jazz jam session, where I looked at what's going on in a jam session, what makes it work, and came up with a model that has seven factors that uh, are proven to 
be crucial for this group creativity option teamwork and over the 100 years that we had jam session it works very well and i also have several publications out where we documented how it can be transferred to any other group settings so we took those seven factors as guidelines and came up with exercises that foster each of these factors and so the first factor of course is competence and knowledge of the field meaning the more you know <laughs> the better you will be at creating options, which seems to be common knowledge, but not really clear often, or it has to be clarified that, you know, we need exercises to foster that. So just the engaging in the habits of journaling, of t keeping track of your ideas, of reflecting deepens that knowledge. And that those are part of these exercises towards the knowledge factor. Second factor is practicing improvisation. So it has been proven, there's a study by Charles Lim from Peabody University who looked at the brain of improvising musicians and found that the activity, the moment you improvise, moves to the prefrontal cortex, means that um, the part of the brain that does the convergent thinking, the inhibition, the evaluation shuts off to provide that opportunity of moving forward and creating those op options, the divergent thinking. And practicing on that on a regular basis fosters this ability and makes you better at improvising. So some of these exercises, of course, are quick improv exercises in class, quick reaction exercises, improv comedy is very good, improvising monologue, just um, reacting with word associations, these kinds of things. Third factor is mentor mentoring systems. So in jam sessions, those who have more experience will be willing to provide uh, or share their experience with those who have less. And similarly, in the classroom, providing these opportunities to interview entrepreneurs, case studies, uh, book reviews, looking at models is crucial. Fourth factor is democracy and collaboration, meaning what we see in jam sessions is that um, everybody gets equal space to move forward and share their ideas. And while everybody else supports, and then we switch off. So uh, similarly in exercises where we mirror each other and react to each other, giving everybody the same space to take the lead versus reacting um, to go with the yes and, and giving everybody the same space to come up with options. Those are ways to, to foster that. Then of course, um, we have to, the next factor is leaders and side people, meaning everybody has a certain role in a group. And it's important that all these roles are covered in order to make sure all the tasks needed are getting done. Uh, otherwise, if everybody's trying to be a leader and the fundraiser, we have enough funds, but <laughs> we can't do anything with it. So, um, some of these is really reflective exercises and looking, who am I? How would I describe myself in a few words? What role am I taking in specific situations and taking these, these quick reflections of yourself exercises. Um, next factor would be community support. We never work in the vacuum. We always have to see look at our environment in terms of resources, in terms of what's needed. And here, some of the sample exercises would be just to change spaces, sit at a new space, do random acts of kindness to people, get reactions, just open your eyes to your community and your environment and take new perspectives. And then finally, there has to be some evaluation system in place while you move forward. You have to quickly react to see <clears throat> this is working. 
here's something I can do. So some of the exercises would be like just walk home in a different route, see what's going on. We have focused observation exercises, just sitting down and observing your environment for half an hour, see what you see, um, then go and look at your observations and what does that tell you about what's going on, what's needed, um, role plays and similar things. So these are some of the sample exercises. And then we went ahead and all the students took pre-tests and post-tests and uh, we evaluated with the hypothesis that we believe there is a significant difference in self-perception of creativity after implementing these regular improvisation exercises in the entrepreneurship classroom. And I'll turn it over to my colleagues, Dan Renard, to talk about how we evaluated the results and what we saw. Thank you, Monica. I will take on uh, the section on uh, methods and the limitations of the study. Um, as Monica mentioned, uh, we conducted this uh, research uh, data collection in the spring semester of 2021, and we had 41 students who consistently uh, you know, responded to the pre-survey and post-survey uh, you know, portion of the study. We certainly taught more than 41 students during that semester, but only retained the ones that were consistent. Uh, they were students of ours at the University of Texas at San Antonio and at Indiana University. And uh, they were not only arts and music majors, but uh, we also had business majors and economics majors, uh, medical, uh, you know, sciences, um, social sciences and education and so forth. And they participated in 40 different, uh, uh, you know, uh, improvisational uh, exercises and uh, we used a Likert scale of 1 to 5 in order to assess uh, their responses to 73 questions that we assembled for them. Uh, questions about ideation, about risk, pressure, uh, boldness and creativity. And um, we wanted to see if uh, from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester if there was a significant difference and, uh, in her self-perception. And so we also needed to assert if our sample was statistically significant, like significantly different from the, the beginning to the end of the semester. And so the best way to treat ordinal data for uh, using the same survey instrument is the Wilcoxon t-test. And uh, so we use that at the 5% uh, confidence uh, rate. Um, and um, the, uh, the Wilcoxon t-test um, basically informs you if there is statistical significance in between the two. And if there indeed there is a statistical significance, then it validates moving forward and uh, keeping moving. Uh, so we had, um, you know, a null hypo a hypothesis that we wanted to reject, or which uh, asserts that there is no significant difference in the self-perception of creativity after implementing regular improvisation exercises in the entrepreneurship classroom. What we noticed is there was a significant uh, difference and we were able to reject that null hypothesis, which was a win for us. Uh, and in this next slide with the results, you see uh, some of, you know, the 30,000 feet, uh, you know, findings that we had. Um, as uh, I mentioned, we had 41 students who participate, who answered both the pre and post surveys, which were identical. The post survey was randomized, so the, the questions were in different order uh, per for each student. But uh, we uh, asked them 73 different questions. And based on their responses, we were able to get the following results. We saw that 
overall across the sample we had 3.6 percent uh, creative capacity increase which was a big win for us we think it's it's uh, it's, it's very it's, it's, it's very positive um, I also we we have a methodology that allows us to have a percentage um, you know value uh, unlike any other study out there and I'll, I'll go into that in a moment uh, we also saw that female participants have more than doubled uh, their creative capacity uh, compared to their counterparts, uh, their male counterparts. Uh, and they had uh, as much as a 4.8% um, uh, creativity increase, which is very significant. Uh, there was not much of the overall increase decrease of uh, undergrad versus grad students uh, based on matriculation. You see also in the table below that the um, the, the the five different um, uh, measures that we used, and so our seventy-three questions were kind of like you know evenly distributed in between those five. Um, so it was creativity and abstraction, and then pressure and stress, uh, persistence. We wanted to see if the students were resilient. Uh, perspective and boldness. You know, are uh, they uh, are they assertive? Are they like you know? You know? Are they um, are they willing to go out there and, and do cold calls and talk to people? Um, and then we had an ideation, curiosity, complexity measure, which is an all-encompassing kind of a, a, a type measure. The the particular questions that we asked were uh, pulled from several sources. And so we took the best of what we found uh, yeah. across the literature. And so what you see here is, uh, again, a female participant did v much better than a male participant, which did okay uh, in most of the measures, except for the perspective and boldness measure. So they are not as assertive, they are not as outgoing, uh, as they should be, uh, as you know, potential entrepreneurs in uh, in a creative sphere, uh, and so that that is a concern. Uh, so uh, a couple of things about the way the data was treated. Um, in the next slide, we see um, you know uh, sums of questioner sample. Sums are important because when you use original data you need to be able to add uh, all 73 questions or whatever number of questions you're asking on a Likert scale, which is a one to five, so there's no zero. So you can't really create a normal distribution uh, the way you would if you had nominal data. But here you, you're really working with ordinal data. And um, because of that uh, methodology, uh, the best way to extrapolate uh, percentage increase is to create a sum. So you add all the values from the, uh, uh, the uh, pre-surveys uh, for each participant and the same thing uh, with the post-survey. And then you have two values. You have the sums before and after. And the, this, this graph shows where all our participants kind of fell uh, across the range of the two, and we see that uh, you know the increase in between the two, uh, and there's a sig statistical significance here visually. We can see it, but um, in order to get the percentage increase, you take the uh, the sum from after, you do, uh, you subtract it from the sum from before, and you divide it by the sum from before, and that gives you pretty much the uh, the um, percentage increase, uh, which is. Um, as far as I can tell, no other studies has used that. Um, and uh, you are not able to read any papers where there is a percentage increase value, uh, uh, you know, associated with the results. Uh, you might see logistic regressions and things like that, but not too much of that sort of work. And so we did two things. Um, we looked at each participant, some before, some after, and, and got the percentage for each individual. Uh, and that gave us the data that you saw previously. 
And we also transpose the data. So we able, so in Excel, you're able to easily transpose data, moving columns to rows, rows to columns. And so uh, by doing so, instead of looking at participant and per participant uh, results, we were able to look at the results per questions. So, uh, you know, assessing each of our 73 questions and, you know, which questions were better received, which questions were worse received. Uh, that helps us so that if we need to fine-tune our instruments moving forward, we can do so. And so that's a really great methodology if you're interested in working uh, with uh, the Wilcoxon t-test and, um, and also, um, you know, creating like um, percentages using ordinal data with the same uh, survey instrument on the front and back end. In terms of conclusion, uh, again, we saw 3.6% of overall increase amongst our participants. Um, this is positive because it confirms that, uh, you know, conducting these exercises, these creativity exercises is effective and, uh, and you know, can inform uh, anyone who's listening to this uh, to um, to replicate the study. I mean, you, and you can repli replicate parts of all of it. Um, so for instance, if you use different surveys and you have uh, different ideas, but you want to use the Wilcoxon t-test, you want to have a mean to show percentage increase, you're welcome to use that portion of our study. Uh, we also observed moderate or negative results for the boldness and perspective uh, measure, as I mentioned. Uh, again, uh, lack of assertiveness, lack of perhaps gut or uh, courage or uh, willing to be outgoing. And perhaps that is, has been tempered due to the pandemic. I mean, that can be certainly you know, one assertion that we can make. Uh, uh, and. Also, we saw that graduate students, and that was when we looked at individual questions, right? Uh, graduate students express, expressed hesitancy for stepping out of their comfort zone and having a secure knowledge and skill base that can counter such as hesitancy. Um, you know, we see that perhaps older students tend to be discouraged from divergent thinking and the possibility of failure. Um, you know, they're more tangled into research-based work and uh, writing a thesis and so forth, and not so much into launching ventures. Um, the gender differences is perhaps one of the largest findings here. We saw that female participants uh, more than double outperformed their male counterparts. And this is significant because most of the entrepreneurship literature uh, you know, um, asserts that, uh, you know, male participants tend to be more entrepreneurial than female participants. And so we are actually able to uh, debunk that and, uh, and uh, you know, show a different paradigm here. Limitation of the study. Uh, you know, of course, a few questions. Did the students uh, truly increase the creative capacity because they engaged in these exercises or did they increase the capacity no matter what just because they're doing like creative things on the side right um i think this being said we had a wide range of students in our classes some that were more or less creative uh so i think that and because we had independently run classes with independent syllabuses and uh different classes honestly a different group of people uh, and so and, and yet the results were very consistent so I think that uh, even though we did not have a control group meaning we didn't like say use a, a class of accountants right or uh, accounting 101 at both university and ask them to take the test and at the beginning and end and not do any of the exercises or do anything creative just number crunch all summer uh, all semester um, we did not do that, but we certainly intend to, to do that uh, moving forward. We only had one uh, non-binary student, as I said, and we certainly hope to have more uh, representation of underrepresented uh, communities in our data set moving forward. 
And um, of course, the exercises were conducted online, and a lot of these exercises were really meant uh, very designed, uh, you know, in person setting mindset, right? But I think we are very creative and we're able to deliver them fairly effectively. And, uh, and the students, I think, enjoyed the overall the, the exercises that we, we provided them with and, and grew from them. So what's next for us? Uh, we are conducting very similar exercises this semester. Now I'm at OU and uh, Monica is still uh, you know, doing it. We kind of synced our syllabuses this semester, so that's exciting. We're doing very much the same exercises. And so we will see if uh, our results uh, held constant. You know, of course, the classes are taught in person this semester, so perhaps we'll outperform what we've uh, shown you. And uh, so we'll have a little bit more of a longitudinal uh, you know, aspect to our, our work here. Uh, we asked our students both uh, in uh, spring 21 and uh, this fall semester uh, to, I mean, this spring semester to, um, um, you know, have journals and reflections that they collect and uh, we able to, uh, based on that, uh, conduct a sentiment analysis. So having a sense of uh, what are the overall feelings, are they positive, are they negative? Uh, what are the words that they use that are like positive or negative and so forth. So it's very much a textual, a textual analysis. And um, so we're excited to, to do that. And we have a lot of material there, but um, it is um, almost like a separate study at this point. Um, and a further study to evaluate uh, the specific exercise sequence. Uh, you know, we want to see if we can fine tune our exercises. We see, want to see if we can fine tune our instruments. And then, of course, you know, use that control group. All right, that's all I have for you today. Uh, and uh, uh, we look forward to your questions at the MIA Summit in May. Thank you so much for listening. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.